On the French-Swiss border near Geneva, with views of Mont Blanc, is CERN. It's the European Organisation for Nuclear Research and is one of the largest centres for scientific research in the world. It's mostly funded by its 20 member states and has a budget this year of around £800 million at today's exchange rate. Scientists here are interested in fundamental physics, trying to find out how the universe works and what it's made of. The Large Hadron Collider is its biggest scientific instrument. Lying deep underground and 27 kilometres in circumference, it's a giant accelerator where beams of subatomic particles collide. I went along to CERN to have a look round. Am I right, Steve, that you were involved from the beginning with the Large Hadron Collider back in the 80s? Yes, I was co-author of the first report, which uh, specified the performance estimates of the LHC. Uh, my boss at the time, Wolfgang Schnell, and I wrote this uh, first note. How long do you think the lifespan of the Large Hadron Collider will be? Well, we had first operation in 2008, and we uh, intend to run the machine until around 2050. Steve Myers is CERN's Director of Accelerators and Technology. He's taking me to the morning meeting in the control centre. Uh, so at least we, we have tested it and then we can, once we have the procedure, we can do it again if needed. Chairing the meeting is Accelerator Coordinator Jörg Venninger. Maybe this was the tune, it's not quite clear. What are you discussing right now? <laughs> <laughs> have you got two hours? <laughs> We're organizing uh, the, daily the daily operation of the Large Hadron Collider in one sentence. <laughs> we, had the ideas also we had some bad luck with cost. vacuum and things, but, but you know. Ah, there was also 25 nanoseconds, I think. Yeah, yeah, I, I there know. Were well, I mean, but there the, were but periods but that are also dedicated yes. for you. There was a discussion going on as to what should be the priorities for the last few weeks of this run before we go into a technical stop. So we will stop operating with BEAM in a few weeks' time. Some people wanted to do some experiments and other people wanted to do other experiments and the total is larger than the total amount of time available. So there was a little bit of horse dealing going on. And that was a room full of physicists? That's a room full of physicists um, and they feel very strongly about what they want to do, of course. What is your role in that meeting? You're chairing it and are you having to juggle competing interests? Yeah, so in fact my role together with one other colleague is to coordinate the machine for a week. So we have a pairs of accelerator coordinators. What we basically do is we don't really necessarily touch the machine per se, but we organize the activities. So we decide uh, when do we inject beam. If experiments have special needs, we try to schedule them or tell them, no, this is not possible, etc. And then every morning at 8.30, at 9 in the weekend, we present basically what has been done in the last 24 hours. And we give an outline roughly of what the next day or the next days are going to be. Any right, acceleration final. What's going on behind us? Okay, as was discussed in the meeting which we just came from, they are now actually changing the settings of one of the experimental magnets and going very slowly in small steps and uh, watching what happens when they change it, what happens to the conditions on the beam. At the fingertips of these guys is control of what's going on underground? Absolutely. The control system which they use, as you say, with their fingertips, allows them to control how the beam behaves underground and they can make a mistake and cause the beam to be aborted. They can improve the beam conditions and what they're doing at the moment is improving the conditions for one experiment by changing the settings of the magnet in that experiment. So CERN is a big place. Yes, it's, there are a lot of big installations and um, this is one of the compressor buildings we're going to. Compressor building is just like a big fridge, so it compresses the gases, makes the helium much colder. We have eight, eight compressor buildings like this around the LHC. So we've got earplugs because it's very noisy in there. Extremely noisy, 120 decibels. In the Large Hadron Collider, beams of subatomic particles travel at high speed. In order to bend the beams around the collider, very powerful magnetic fields are produced with superconducting magnets. The magnets need to operate at a very low temperature and liquid helium is used in the cooling process. 
I'm going with Steve to the Magnet Testing Centre to find out more about how the Large Hadron Collider works. Ed Chiapalla is an engineer developing the radio frequency systems at CERN. Okay, so here we have an RF cavity of the type which is used in the Large Hadron Collider. There are 16 of these in the LHC and it's these which provide the accelerating voltage to bring the beam to its top energy. So the beam travels through there? That's correct. And inside the cavity it sees an electric field which accelerates the charged particle and that makes an equivalent of 2 million volts of acceleration. The cavities which are meant to accelerate the beam are very sensitive. The surfaces have to be very clean, otherwise you cannot reach very high electrical field into the cavities. And in order to reach 6 or 7 megavolts per meter, you need absolutely clean um, surfaces. That's the reason why everything is done in very clean environments and therefore in clean rooms. Olivier Brunner is a physicist who develops the radio frequency cavities used at CERN. So this is a concrete bunker where you test the cavities and because a big electrical field is produced, you have to shut these in order to protect the outside world. Exactly. These doors are open only to access the bunker or to install the cavities. When the before the test will start, we actually close the bunker with these big doors and to protect the, uh, us from the X-rays. Jean-Philippe is going to explain the differences between the two types of magnet used in the Large Hadron Collider. Here you, are, you have the two main types of magnet. This is a dipole, and a dipole is a magnet that is curving the trajectory of the protons in the accelerator. These are very huge magnets, 15 meters long and 30 tons, and very accurate, with a very high field, working at a very low temperature. We say it's 2 Kelvin, it is minus 271 degrees below, uh, below zero degrees Celsius. And the other type of magnet are these superconducting quadrupoles. And these superconducting quadrupoles are like uh, glasses. They are focusing the beam, really trying to make it as small, as dense as possible. And how many of these types of magnets do you have in the Large Hadron Collider? So for the Large Hadron Collider, we have 1,232 superconducting dipoles and about 400 superconducting quadrupoles. What are we looking at on that board? That board is giving the status of the magnet that we have here. And presently, this magnet inside is at minus 271 centigrade. And it also gives you the pressure and the current. So that in there is colder than outer space? Exactly, because this is, there is a cryostat there that can insulate the magnet that is at minus 271 centigrade from the outer uh, atmosphere. Which is good news for us. Yeah, because you can feel it, it's room temperature. So CERN is one of the coldest places in the world, but it's also one of the hottest, or the hottest. It is the hottest because where the particles actually collide, the temperatures are of the order of a million times higher than the temperature on the sun. It's just mind-boggling, isn't it? I mean, it's just difficult to comprehend. But it's in a very, very small volume. So now we're going to the magnet rescue factory where we repair magnets which have faults in the, in the tunnel. So these are the insides? This is the inside of the magnet and they are here to be fixed and to be prepared for installation in the Large Hadron Collider. The two beams are both travelling at almost, almost the speed of light. Tell me what happens when they collide. So the two bunches of protons are crossing each other and some protons are colliding really head-on and then generating new particles inside the experiments of the Large Hadron Collider. Paolo Fessier is the magnet design and technology section leader at CERN. These objects are 15 meters long, 28 tons of weight, but the conductors that makes the magnetic field in the magnet has to be positioned with a precision better than 0.01 millimeters. So we have to compare very good precision with very large scale objects, and putting this together is very difficult, very challenging. Collaborations of scientists have set up experiments, part funded by CERN, that use detectors to measure the results of the particle collisions in the Large Hadron Collider. One of these is run by CMS. 
Hi Matthew, welcome to CMS. I'm Austin Ball, I'm technical coordinator of the CMS experiment. And what we're going to show you here is how we use the beams of the Large Hadron Collider to do physics. So let's have a look at the control room. Tell me how CMS fits in with CERN. Well, CMS is an international collaboration of, of about 160 scientific institutes, scientific and technical institutes from about 40 countries around the world, which has got together uh, to propose a program of physics using the beams that are generated at the, the Large Hadron Collider, so using proton-proton collisions to gain a better understanding of the structure of matter and energy and particularly by looking at uh, conditions that haven't existed since a fraction of a second after the Big Bang. This is a way that we can test scientific theories about the origins of matter and particularly look for uh, predicted particles like the Higgs boson, which is uh, supposedly the reason, for instance, why a proton is 2,000 times heavier than an electron. Understanding what mass is and why different constituents of matter have different masses is a, is a principal objective. Uh, of the physics program at the LHC. This is what a cross-section of the experiment looks like in miniature because in reality this is 14 meters across and the experiment is uh, 23 meters long. This shows you the, ver the different layers of the experiment which have different functions uh, to detect uh, the products that are formed when the proton beams collide in the center. So Matthew, this is the shaft that we're going to go down. This is going to take us uh, 100 meters underground. This is the personnel access shaft for the CMS underground facilities. If you just uh, look carefully over the edge, you get an idea of the, of the scale and the distance that we're going to go down. Yeah. This is the 27 kilometer circumference uh, Large Hadron Collider ring. And we're here at collision point five in SESI. This is where the compact muon solenoid is installed. So here we are in the service cavern through that seven meter thick reinforced concrete wall at the end is the experiment and the circulating beams in the Large Hadron Collider. And from here in this service cavern, the power, the cooling, everything the experiment needs to operate is sent out to it and back from it comes the data. The proton beams collide in the, in the core of CMS 40 million times a second. Bunches of protons collide and there could be up to 20 proton-proton collisions every time that happens. So from that enormous amount of data, we have to reduce uh, we have to select out events that are interesting, collisions that are interesting. And we start that process here in this cavern. We go from 40 million times 20 uh, events per second down to 100,000 a second. And those 100,000 a second we send upstairs to the control room. And there we filter down again. Eventually just 100 events a second get recorded. Even that generates a vast amount of data. It's about a megabyte per event. And this has to be this requires a completely new philosophy of computing called the GRID, which was initiated for the Large Hadron Collider experiments, which allows all that data to be distributed around the world and processed by all of the collaborating institutes that are members of these big scientific collaborations. How does the machinery down here know to filter out the not interesting stuff or the less interesting stuff and give you the interesting stuff and send it upstairs? Well, fortunately, we know enough about the fundamental structure of matter to understand the, 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 the basic features of these proton-proton collisions, and particularly the signatures which would be involved with new physics. So these, these are relatively simple to understand based on the previous store of scientific knowledge and very sophisticated simulations of what's going to happen when the proton beams collide. So that knowledge, if you like, exists in small processes, many, many of them here in this, uh, this cavern, which do the job of filtering out the stuff which is potentially interesting from the stuff that we can say is not going to be interesting. So I'm going to take you to the entrance to the experimental cavern, but of course, as the machine, the LHC, is operating today, we won't be able to go through. And so through here, Austin, is the Large Hadron Collider itself. Indeed. This is as far as we can go today, but through there, around the corner, the Large Hadron Collider and the CMS experiment. So this is what we call an event display, and this is what happened in one particularly interesting event where a pair of protons collided 
at the heart of CMS. So you, this is a representation of the cross-section of the experiment which is with its different layers which have different functions. So we can see that in, in the products produced by that collisions there were many charged particles and we see them bending in the intense magnetic field of, uh, of CMS. And then there was electromagnetic and hadronic energy and then in the outer part of the detector in this particular event not much activity. So nonetheless this is a very interesting signature. This is an event which we will want to record and which we'll want to uh, want to analyze further in one of the many institutes around the world that will have access to, to, the, to this event and many the other hundred events per second that we're recording. So this is the computer farm and the job of this farm of about 4,000 computers mounted in racks but very similar to the ones that you the PC that you have at home. These reduce the, the rate of the data that's arriving at 100,000 events per second from underground to the 100 events per second that we're actually going to record and send around the world for analysis. Before the Large Hadron Collider came into operation, there were concerns expressed about the consequences of colliding subatomic particles at high energies. How worried were you before the Large Hadron Collider started operationally in 2008 that something catastrophic would happen? Well, I wasn't worried at all, um, uh, primarily because uh, we had already considered uh, the possibility or the probability of anything like this having a serious impact and some of the best theoretical physicists in the world convinced us there was no danger at all. Given that a lot of taxpayers' money goes into CERN, do you feel a big responsibility? Very much so and um, I feel a big responsibility towards primarily technology transfer, that we transfer our technology back to European industry and we also to training of people, young people at primary school, secondary school and university. Uh, we get them interested in physics and we train the older people, the older uh, group at CERN. We have teacher training programs for teaching physics correctly and we take this very, very seriously as part of our mission. What do you think needs to happen for the Large Hadron Collider to be considered a success? Well, for me it's already happened. The machine's working and working beautifully. The detectors are working and working fantastically well. In terms of, uh, in terms of discovery, we hope that by the end of 2012, or we're sure by the end of 2012, that we will have either discovered the Higgs boson or excluded it from the standard model. Either of these uh, discoveries will be major. The LHC will continue to run many years after that at higher energy and higher performance and will almost certainly produce many more discoveries in the elementary particle physics arena. I'm off to meet physicist Fabiola Giannotti, the spokesperson of another experiment at CERN called ATLAS, and her colleague, British physicist Bill Murray. What are you searching for at ATLAS? We are uh, trying to address and hopefully answer several questions and mysteries that have been uh, uh, with us for now decades. Um, examples are the famous uh, X boson, the most elusive uh, particle ever, which would explain uh, the, the origin of the, the particle uh, masses. Uh, another question is to understand the composition of dark matter, which, cons which constitutes 20%, 25% of the universe and in general uh, address many, many other questions that today uh, we are not able to, uh, uh, to, uh, to answer. But one of the sort of classic pieces that we need to be able to answer, we have to be able to answer, is, is the Higgs boson there? Does it exist? And we have the detector that can answer that question. And we now have just about enough data to be able to be sensitive to wherever it's searching, wherever it's hiding. Do you think you are going to find it? I've thought that for 20 years. Um, we don't know whether it's there or not. We will know whether it's there. We, we can tell you that we can make a big discovery, a really big discovery. Is this the explanation to where mass comes from? But we can't tell you what the answer to that is yet. If it's there, we're going to find it. Uh, most likely by the end of uh, next year. If it's not there, we will sh should be able to say, to demonstrate that it's not there. So also in that case, it will be a, a huge uh, discovery and a huge revolution, of course, because the Higgs boson has been such a central piece of our understanding of fundamental uh, particles interaction. So um, every outcome will be uh, exciting. 
Do you think if you discover the Higgs boson, or if you discover conclusively that it doesn't exist, do you think that that will have a big impact on the world around us in practical terms? Um, I think so, although it's very difficult to predict in the short term. Uh, I'm convinced that every uh, step forward in fundamental knowledge, uh, sooner or later, has also an impact on uh, practical life, uh, because it has an impact on, on, on mankind and my, mankind progress. So, for instance, when uh, when uh, uh, J.J. Thompson observed for the first time a little beam of, of, of electrons, he could not imagine the impact that the electron would have on practical life. And today, we could not live without electricity. So, it's it's uh, every time uh, uh, mankind uh, in increases their, their knowledge. Uh, I, I'm sure that, of course, there are uh, um, many many possibilities for progress and for practical uh, for practical. Uh, um, consequences. We should not forget also that in order to discover the Higgs boson, we had to build these fantastic instruments, the LHC accelerator and the experiments, which use uh, cutting edge technologies. And, so, and already developing those technologies has, of course, had an impact on society, on industry, on our medical application, because of course we have transferred our knowledge to other fields. Next I'm meeting with physicist Jeffrey Hankst, the spokesperson for an experiment called Alpha and Tommy Erickson, who looks after the operational aspects of the anti-proton decelerator at CERN. Well, I supply Jeff here with the antiprotons, about 50 million every minute. And what do you do with these antiprotons? So, we have an experiment here, a collaboration called Alpha, and the idea is to use the antiprotons to make an anti-atom, anti-hydrogen, the very simplest antimatter atom that you can make, because we'd like to study that and compare it to normal hydrogen, right, which is the most abundant element in the universe. The idea is to see if those two things obey the same laws of physics. It's very, very simple. Antimatter and matter, do they obey the same laws of physics? So our collaboration makes antihydrogen, and very recently we learned how to trap it, how to hold on to it. Matter and antimatter don't get along very well. They annihilate, make energy when they meet each other. So in order to study the antimatter, you have to confine it somehow. You have to hold on to it. And that's what Alpha does. What we've done very recently is to learn how to make these anti-atoms and hold them so that we can start to study them. In fact, that's what we're doing right now. We're trying to make the first real measurements on antimatter atoms. Results announced in September from a scientific collaboration called OPERA suggested that subatomic particles known as neutrinos had gone faster than the speed of light. CERN has been supplying these neutrinos for the scientists in Italy. Edek Schwentner is part of the CERN team responsible for their production. We send here at CERN around 10 to the 17 neutrinos per day. That's what we send to Italy. And in Italy at the detector, they measure around 30 neutrinos only out of these 10 to the 17 neutrinos. So what it means is in order to measure something in Italy, we need to send them a lot, really a lot, and they in addition also need a huge detector so that they can measure something and measure also something at least. What do you think is the likelihood that this experiment, where the speed of light on the face of it has been exceeded, what do you think the likelihood is that this will stand the test of further investigation? It's a very interesting result and now we have to test it and we have to cross-check it. So we will see after these cross-checks whether it will stand or not. Pablo Alvarez was involved in measuring the time of flight from CERN to Gran Sasso in Italy. Here we have a, an atomic clock, this one, it's a cesium clock, and it provides a very stable frequency. Uh, a very stable at pulse per second. And this one is a, a GPS receiver that decodes the signal coming from the satellite. It takes the, the time from the coming from the satellite and it compares it with the time provided by the by the cesium clock. And with that, it, uh, we, after this comparison, we are able to extract a clock stable at the one nanosecond level between here and Italy. Before leaving CERN, I went to meet a theoretical physicist called Gian Giudice to get his views on the OPERA experiment. If it turns out that the speed of light has been beaten, how significant would that be for physics? Um, that would be certainly a great uh, conceptual revolution. 
because uh, the constancy of the speed of light is the fundamental principle of special relativity. Uh, th this experiment, if true, would tell you that uh, that principle is not valid, at least for, for neutrinos. Uh, that means that not only should we reconsider our view on special relativity, but on all the theories that we construct for the particle world. Uh, these theories are based on the idea that there is, a, there is a symmetry between space and time, that they are treated exactly in the same way by nature, by the physical laws, and uh, there is one single entity called space-time. Uh, if this measurement were, tr were true, then uh, neutrinos would see space and time in a different way, and that would require a complete uh, reconsideration of the way we view space-time. So, yes or no? Do you think it's been beaten? Uh, I can't tell. I'm a scientist, so I, don't, I don't, shouldn't have believed. Uh, I should wait for a final confirmation from the data. But if you press me, I'm very, very skeptical. Uh.